I'd like to take to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us here at ECRAF. And um, as we start, I would like us to, to know who is in the room before we officially start the program. And thank you so much for making it. As we wait for more participants to join in, uh, please feel uh, free, feel welcome. I'm sure everyone by now has taken a cup of coffee, feeling warm. So welcome. So I'll, I want us to know who is in the room. Just uh, introduce your name, uh, your organization, just a quick round of introductions and make sure you press the speak button so that the, our online participants can also hear. Okay, we could start from here. Hi, my name is Ikitao. My speech is not so good. I come from Severa Farm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the next. We are doing a round of introduction, your name and your organization before we officially start. Press the speak button so that our online participants can hear. Can hear. Yes, I'm Dr. J. Munene, and uh, I'm from. I'm an exporter, but also working with the civil society. With the civil society. Yeah. You thank you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Society of Kenya. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Most welcome. Let's we'll go to that table. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Njonjo uh, from VegPro. Um, thank you so much for inviting us and uh, great to have uh, one Ernest Muthomi around. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Good morning. Uh, this is Altere, uh, farmer from uh, Muranga. Thank you. You're welcome. Morning, everyone. My name is uh, Beatrice Joki from Embu. I'm a producer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Good morning. My name is Tom Owar. I work for Dairin Packaging and Business Advisory Services. We support uh, the Avocado Valley Chain. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joseph Gitege from Ruadi Angoro Farm, an avocado farmer from Nyahururu. Morning. Ngare Ireri from Embu County, a producer. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I'm Sunguti Elizabeth from Stockholm Environment Institute. Good morning. Moses Kerim is my name, SEI. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Calvin Sokelo from Mshamba, a platform for market access. Good morning. My name is Mukami Gitao. I work for AgroCares, a Dutch innovation a company that uh, manufactures sensor-based soil testing uh, equipment. Good morning. I'm Zipora Kuria. I work for Steve IPM Association located in Ruiro, Kiambu Subcounty. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kamanza Musau. I represent Manzoni Plantations in Lloyd Tok Tok County, one of the large orchards in Kenya. Good morning. My name is Kelvin Dongo, representing Olivado EPZ Limited from Rang. Thank you. Good morning, all. My name is Anne Miner from Sitela Acres Limited, and I am a grower and exporter. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Anthony Morithi from Antosiavo. We are exporters working with uh, farmers from Moranga. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alpha Eluta from Stockholm Environment Institute. So good morning, everyone. I'm Romano Zopio from Stockholm Environment Institute. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Charity Waini from Stockholm Environment Institute. Also. Okay, I think we have two more. Pauline. Good morning. I'm Pauline Mesharia from Stockholm Environment Institute. Good morning. I'm Anderson Kibila from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm Cynthia Sitati. I uh, work at Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Romano Sopio, who would give uh, the opening remarks and officially start this workshop. Welcome, Dr. Opio. Yes, good morning once again. Uh, I think it also be fair to give opportunity to the online participants also to introduce themselves because I can see before we can, I can give my speech. Yeah. Kindly the online participants, maybe I can start with Lawrence. Yeah, good morning uh, uh, participants. My name is Lawrence Anzule. I'm from the Stockholm Environment Institute and I'm happy to be here at the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Langdon. I'm from the uh, European Climate Foundation, and we're partnered with uh, SCI on this, and I'm uh, from the uh, the trade program at ECF. Thank you, Matthew. And fortunate. Uh, good morning. My name is Amiami Fortunate. I'm the Deputy Executive Secretary of ESTECO, in charge of projects and program and a partner in this project. Thank you. Thank you, for fortunate, yeah. So colleagues, uh, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to ICRAF and also to this particular conference. But I would like, before I can make any speech, also to recognize all of you, and more particularly, Ernest, uh, for gracing this occasion. And Ernest, I want just to give you maybe a minute just to say something, because this is also your constituency. If you can step up and just give some few remarks, then I'll, I can give my remarks after that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bueno, Pio, uh, Stockholm Environment Institute uh, staff, members of the Avocado Society here present. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm actually most humbled to be here today for this workshop. Scores of years ago, a great gentleman who I happened to meet, Jagan Giesbach, spent a lot of time piecing together the characterization of avocado and other fruit crops for the benefit of nutrition in this country. Is a, is a man that we one time as the Avocado Society nominated and gave an award. I can see Kamanzu here at Vegipro here and other heroes that last week we gave them awards because the Avocado Society recognizes people in this journey that are committed to a sustainable and profitable agribusiness. So it's great honor for, for, for us and for me to be here today as the CEO of the Avocado Society of Kenya and to pay great tribute to the World Agroforestry Center, ICRAF. Because when the history of avocados in this country is written, there will be a chapter for ICRAF. Because the story about avocados and uh, 
growing and encouraging farmers because avocado is actually a forestry tree. So without much ado, I really want to say that uh, we want to thank the conceivers of this project because EU is really one of our great markets and we have challenges, but we feel the challenges are not insurmountable. And when we have someone working along with us to make sure that uh, we right the wrongs and we uh, make uh, the land flat so that we can actually play our great role in uh, providing market access and changing livelihoods and creating jobs for our young people. And of course, improving the economy of this country is something that we are happy to work along and to support with all that we have. So thank you very much. Um, like the rest of us, Hamia, so that we can start this journey together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and God bless all of you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ernest, uh, for those opening remarks. And uh, we are really happy also to have you around and other participants. Uh, colleagues, I would also like also to give opportunity to Fortunate, who is uh, our partner in this particular project. Uh, Fortunate, if you can also make some few remarks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. Um, as I said, my name is Amiand Fortunate. I'm the Deputy Executive Secretary of Esteco, and also uh, part of this uh, implementation of this uh, pro project. So, Esteco is one of the institutions, specialized institutions in the, in the ESC, and we are based in Kigali, but obviously uh, looking at the uh, science, technology, and innovation uh, in the seven countries now, and we have added the eighth, which is now Somalia. Um, we have many projects on the EU uh, uh, Africa market, especially with the markup project. And the uh, EU market access for avocado agribusiness is very important for uh, ESC in terms of uh, uh, accessing market in the EU. So accessing European market for avocado agribusiness involves complying with the European regulations and standards. And the, one of the areas where we need to understand is the understanding of EU regulations. First, familiarizing ourselves with the EU regulations, which are related to the import of uh, codos and also the EU specific standards. Uh, EU general food law or EU plant health regulations are very specific regulations for avocado that we should understand. Uh, without forgetting the quality standards, uh, we have to ensure that our avocados meet the EU quality standards, and this includes factors like size, weight, color, absence of pests and diseases, and also implementing good agricultural practices to maintain high quality standards throughout the production process. I also have to comply with the EU phytosanitary requirements, which prevent the introduction and spread of plant pests. Uh, we also need to ensure robust traceability systems to track the production and distribution of avocados by maintaining actual records to demonstrate compliance with EU regulations, and also ensure that all required documents, documentation, including invoices, certification of origin, phytosanitary certifications are complete and accurate. Uh, we also look, need to look at a certification. Considering obtaining certifications such as global AP, this is good agricultural practice, and other recognized certificates can enhance our, our marketability of our avocados in the EU. Uh, we need also to adhere to uh, EU packaging and labeling requirements to ensure that the packaging materials are safe and comply with the EU regulations and provide a clear and accurate labeling, including information of origin, variety, and also relevant certification. In addition, we need also to engage with export support agencies, work closely with the Kenya export uh, support agencies and agriculture authorities to stay informed about the latest EU regulation market requirements. 
We also need to as seek assistance from in agencies that can help with the market access, certification, and export uh, logistics. Obviously, we need also to build our relationships uh, to ensure our relationship with EU importers and distributors, participate in trade fairs, events, showcase our products, and network with the potential buyers. We need also to stay informed about the market trends, uh, where we stay updated on the market trends and consumer preference in the EU. This knowledge can help you tailor your products to meet the demands of the market. Uh, we need also to continuously improve uh, and access our production and export processes based on the feedback, market changes, and evolving regulations. Uh, in conclusion, therefore, by following these steps and maintaining commitment of quality, compliance, overcade agribusiness in Kenya can enhance our chances of successful access to EU market. And we need to keep in mind that the regulations and requirements may evolve, so we need to stay informed and adaptable to, to the conditions and the standards of the trade. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, fortunate for that. Yeah, so colleagues, uh, let me allow me to make uh, this speech. This opening speech I'm doing it on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Filippo Sano, who's the center director, who's away in Dubai on Climate COP28. Yeah. So I'll just go down to the speech. Yeah. So first, Mr. Matthew Langdon, European Climate Foundation. Then we have Mr. Munyambi Fortunate, Executive Secretary, Estaco, Esteco. Then we have uh, Mr. Esther, uh, Ernest Mudomi, CEO of the Avocado Society of Kenya. Uh, partners, including the Avocado Agri Enterprises, and also I had uh, also participation from the civil societies organizations. So let me first welcome all of you to this important workshop on EU market access for avocado agribusiness in Kenya. The workshop main uh, objectives are to first share project findings on climate smart avocado production management practices, including the challenges and opportunities across the avocado value chain, the EU market requirements, and the niche development of the avocado value chain. So is a forum also a platform for uh, sharing of the findings of this particular project. The second one is co-developing the avocado agribusiness, the practical recommendations to overcome the production, post-harvest, and market challenges across the avocado value chain. And as Stock Environment Institute, we know that even as scientists, we don't monopolize knowledge. So co-creation is one of the key way of ensuring that the stakeholders have greater input in terms of how you can co-develop solution. And thirdly, to discuss sector-specific strategies and guidelines for implementing the recommendation. So as Stock Environment Institute, we want first to appreciate your role of each and every one of you in playing this particular, particular topical issue and particularly pleased with the support we are receiving from the European Climate Foundation to provide scientific leadership and the role of ESTECO of promoting and coordinating the development, management and application of science technology in supporting regional integration and socioeconomic development. So the avocado is just one of the entry point in terms of the regional uh, uh, focus, in terms of science and technology. And I'm happy that here as experts, we are able also to learn from you. So as an international research and policy institution, whose focus is how, to, is how we can bridge science, policy and practice, this project gives us a good opportunity to support and provide evidence-based opportunity to use avocado value chain as a basis of trade between East Africa community and EU, and hoping that this will also provide guidance to other agricultural products from the region. I know maybe now we are focused on agriculture, on avocado, but I know also as experts, we might also be following other products which might also find their way to, to the EU market. So it's a good opportunity also for this. Yeah, so this effort should not be seen as benefiting the trade between ESC and EU market alone, but should also be embraced as a culture. Uh, as a culture, we need to adopt and embrace as East African community and more so Kenya, because this this uh, the findings will be focusing about the Kenya products, and also in promoting innovative, competitive, and safe food products for both our local 
and traditional market. Also, we value ourselves as local market, as local consumers of, of avocado. So this is a good opportunity also to improve even what we also circulate uh, um, uh, around the, our local market. So we look forward, continue partnering with the European Climate Foundation, ISTECO, agri entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and all interested stakeholders in developing favorable policies out of this research, in scaling up this work to a national and regional policy level platform for consistency uptake of the results. So Stockholm Environment Institute is a strong believer of science, policy, practice, nexus. So whatever we gather here should also inform some policies. And if it inform policy, it should also inform practice so that we are consistent in terms of how we use knowledge to develop ideas. And so now it's uh, uh, so it's now my humble duty to invite Mr. Matthew Langdon from the European Climate, who has been uh, very kind to grant us this fund to help us this project, to make his, uh, his remarks and officially open this workshop. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for that very kind in for, uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone for being with us bright and early this morning. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Matthew Langdon. I'm from the trade program at the European Climate Foundation, uh, which fundamentally sort of looks at how uh, the trading system can be used more purposefully uh, for, for the climate transition. And so I also especially want to thank Anderson and the team from SEI uh, for, for bringing us all together uh, this morning on this really important initiative. Um, I'm going to keep my introduction brief because I'm calling you from uh, the COP28 today. Um, I know we say we only have one planet, but sometimes the COP really does feel like a different world. But what I did want to say about part of the reason why the European Climate Foundation decided to team up with the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, on this project is that we see um, through venues like the COP, but also through other international fora that there, there really is a growing rift between developed countries that uh, had the chance to industrialize you know, a long time ago and, and developing countries that have every legitimate aspiration uh, to join them. Um, but so there's an increasing concern that the requirements that jurisdictions like the EU put on imported products uh, make it harder for producers in developing countries to trade their way to a better livelihood. And this is exactly the opposite message and the opposite policy uh, that, that we are at ECF are, are hoping to send and, and are hoping to see um, in a world that's increasingly at risk of climate disruption, especially for agriculture. Um, trade is not only going to be a tool for food security, uh, but also for a globally just transition. And so that's why we're very happy to be able to support the SEI and its work on climate smart value chains for coffee and avocados in the East African community. And I'm really looking forward to the discussions uh, and the insights that we'll take away from our round table today. Uh, so thanks again for, for being here. And with that, I'm happy to declare this workshop open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you everyone for your attention up until this moment. So um, next, I think we'll uh, go for a group photo and then a tea break. Then we come back for the second sessions where we'll have presentations and uh, breakout sessions. So um, Pauline, Maybe you could guide us on where to take the photo or a group photo. You go outside, then uh, the stairs, that's where we'll take the group photo.
So um, I hope you guys, you all have a, a relaxing 15 minutes break. Refresh to start with the core of our of our workshop. So um, <clears throat> we will continue with uh, some very key highlights on the research that we've done to showcase some of the result results. And uh, after we have about two presentations from two of our project staff. After the presentation, then we will have a few uh, minutes to get some uh, questions from the group regarding what has been presented. And thereafter, we will now go to the breakout groups. We will have to deep dive you know, in terms of how we relate the results to the practicalities on the ground. And then get, if there are any mismatch, then you highlight that, that we also incorporate into the report that will go back to the uh, to, to the donor. And then we now see how to start um, the engagement so that they actually get into their policy documents to facilitate uh, trade for East African avocado farmers. Okay, so um, I will just begin with uh, Sorry about that. So I'll begin with uh, the workshop objectives. As earlier alluded by my colleague uh, Romanos, I just want to reiterate uh, what why we are here. We are actually here to understand the challenges that uh, avocado farmers are facing on the ground in terms of, you know, production right up to the market. So what are the production challenges, the uh, storage processing. So we're looking across the whole value chain to actually identify those key issues. And then later on, we will now, you know, uh, co-develop some of the, uh, you know, uh, recommendations that you think will be practical in terms of overcoming those challenges. We've um, actually have some already some recommendations in the report, but we want also to like bring that together so that we validate some of those uh, recommendations and then the, come up with a very comprehensive uh, practical recommendations to overcome those challenges that uh, have, have been faced by agribusinesses on the ground. Then the third ob uh, uh, objective is now to develop specific strategies. So from the recommendations, what are the strategies that could be put in place to implement those re recommendations? Because as I just learned from uh, one of our colleagues that uh, those recommendations are already there in the books but yet nothing is being done on the ground. So that's the gap we want to fill. What are the specific strategies that need to be done to implement those recommendations? In terms of the outcomes, it's just simply to enhance the understanding of the challenges that we face, as well as opportunities that exist and all those opportunities are there to actually upgrade the entire value chain from the production right up to the market. The second expected outcome is the recommendations that we will have from uh, all participants, which we, have, which we will go in the different groups, looking at the different stages across the value chain from production, uh, post-harvest, as well as right up to the market. And the market here, even though the project is focused on the international market, but you also have to look at opportunities to exploit, to explore 
both the local and regional markets. Let's not forget about those uh, two key markets as well. And last but not least, the specific uh, strategies that we all develop to implement those recommendations. So those are the three expected outcomes from this workshop. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Elizabeth, who will now proceed with the next phase of the presentation. Thank you, Anderson. As you've all heard, I'm Sunguti Elizabeth. Uh, mine was to look at uh, meta-analysis, uh, comparing climate smart practices and a control without these climate smart practices, uh, mainly focusing on avocado within the East African community. Then maybe a quick uh, definition. Uh, when we talk of climate smart agriculture, uh, currently, we know that climate change is quite an issue that is affecting production. So as much as we are producing, we need to make sure that it's sustainably, such that our productivity increases, uh, we are able to be resilient to climatic stressors, and at the same time, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And then... Uh, uh, the methodology, mainly I want to provide you an overview of uh, research findings on alternative climate smart avocado based practices within the East African community. Uh, the meta analysis integrated findings from both gray and peer reviewed uh, or academic literature. Uh, this was based on 287 observations or treatments uh, from 35 studies. When I talk of observations, it means that within each uh, study, they are comparing on one side a climate smart practice against a control without the climate smart practice using the conventional ways of production. And then uh, the meta, what the meta-analysis does, like once we look at the various climate smart practices, we try to integrate them together to find a mean. Like if we put uh, this climate pra smart practice into practice, how would the yields compare with a pr uh, with the conventional production without the climate smart practice? And based on our research findings, we find that when the climate smart practices are put uh, into practice, they improve avocado yields by 29.3%. Like if one farmer does the climate smart and another one conventional, like the one with the climate smart practice would have 29.3% more yields, more avocado yields compared to one without. Then intercropping and Im improved avocado varieties, uh, intercropping increases yields by up to 56.7%, while improved yields that, this include yields that are climate, Resi uh, resilient, they are also able to increase yields by up to 46.2%. While organic fertilizer and irrigation both had similar uh, small positive effects, which increase yields by up to 26.6%. Uh, and then in conclusion, like given the three benefits provided for by climate smart agricultural practices, uh, our results provide adequate insights on how climate smart practices would impact uh, avocado yields. And then based on research, it's been found that effective implementation of these practices have the potential to simultaneously reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, enhance productivity, and improve the resilience of the farming systems in the region even in the face of a changing climate, ensuring sustainability of our production while at the same time mitigating climate change effects. Basically, that's all I had for you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. So we want to proceed from there and now look at the opportunities to improve productivity and sustainability of avocado value chain in East Africa. So we are going to look at some of the challenges uh, that uh, are being faced in each and every stage of the value chain. We are, we are also going to look at the, the uh, opportunities for upscaling the value chain in each and every uh, uh, stage, and then look at the cost for transitioning to sustainability, and then look at some of the policy issues that are needed. And then from there, this will inform the discussion that we are going to have uh, to now trying to interrogate some of these results and also try to beef it up with what is actually happening on the ground. And that's why we decided to ensure that we have the key stakeholders uh, uh, here with us to have a focused uh, discussion with the, with the stakeholders. It's been alluded to already the importance of uh, avocado. Avocado is very key in East Africa and more so in Kenya in terms of uh, economic growth, in terms of rural development, uh, foreign exchange, earnings. But there's a lot of emphasis now on sustainability. And with this emphasis on sustainability, it has led to re-evaluation uh, of the avocado value chain, as well as a shift towards uh, adopting sustainable practices, because it is not a mere choice right now, but it is a requirement to impress sustainability in the production, in the processing, in the storage, in the marketing of avocado. So it's not a mere choice, because in the global context, there's now prioritization of climate resilience, this prioritization of resource uh, conservation, this prioritization of ethical practices. And it is therefore imperative for the avocado value chain to adopt innovative approaches to conduct uh, business. So sustainability uh, of value chain offers not only the potential for conserving the environment, but also enhancing livelihoods. And my colleague has just mentioned, uh, when you have some of these climate smart practices in the production, it increases the yield. So it is it helps not only in conserving the environment, but also enhancing the livelihoods through increased yield. It also facilitates the market entry. When you talk about uh, the market right now, people are very conscious on what they are actually eating. So when you go to supermarkets, in that section where we have the organic products, you realize that it's even more expensive than non organic uh, products. So even in the markets, in the EU markets, they're also looking at some of these sustainability aspects. So it facilitates market entry as well as upholding the integrity of uh, avocado uh, products in the context of uh, global trade. So when you look at East Africa, you realize that there is very high potential for avocado in East Africa. And actually, when you look at this particular graph, you realize that Kenya is actually leading the, 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 the one in red. Uh, Kenya is leading in production of uh, avocado compared to other countries. Ethiopia is also coming through, uh, is part of the Eastern Africa. So it's not East, East Africa community, but we consider Ethiopia as Eastern Africa uh, region. So you realize that there is also very high uh, production of avocado from Ethiopia, although Kenya is leading. But the key highlight here, you realize that even though Kenya is leading in the world market for avocado, most of the production is done by the small scale farmers. And we were just having a discussion when we were having our coffee break on some of these issues and the challenges of uh, this so production is mainly by the small scale, uh, the small scale farmers. And with the small scale farming, you realize that from the research that we've conducted, most of the varieties that are grown are indigenous, actually 70%. But now there is this transition from the indigenous varieties to these high valued uh, varieties, like the Forte as well as the Hass uh, avocado. 
But again, also when you look at the transition, the trend, we are also now moving also from the fighter to has because there is a lot of um there's a lot of uh, uh um um preference for the has variety of avocado it's very good high resistance to pests and diseases it has high uh, oil content as well it's also well adaptable to our conditions in east africa and particularly in kenya and that's why there is uh, some uh, transition from the indigenous varieties from fuerte to has production and hoping that this will enhance our productivity. Uh, you, when you talk about uh, climate smart farming, which is one of the key things that we are actually looking at, we, as I, as I mentioned, uh, the global context is now prioritizing climate resilience issues. Uh, you just heard from our colleague from the EU, who's currently at the COP and he tried to mention some of these aspects, the aspects of eth eth ethical issues in terms of production, ethical issues, how do we ensure that we ensure that we conserve the environment even though we are producing, we conserve the environment, we conserve, uh, we, we ensure that we uh, enhance biodiversity because we are tackling three main things that is climate change, we are tackling pollution, we are tackling biodiversity loss. So how do we ensure that as we grow avocado, we also try to ensure that we don't uh, affect the biodiversity, we don't pollute the environment, and also mitigate or adapt to uh, climate change. So when you look at the sustainability practices uh, along the avocado value chain, uh, from our discussions, and I know it is going to come uh, from, the, from the group discussions, you are the key experts. And as we said, we want to co-develop some of these um, highlights uh, that will uh, then help us to uh, um, come up with proper policies and documents that will support our community, support our farmers, support the exporters uh, to access the EU market. So there are various sustainable practices along the avocado value chain, which I'll just mention. I know most, some of them will also come from the group discussion and I'll just highlight those that were uh, evident. So under production, you realize that farmers are now trying to uh, uh, and, uh, get themselves in soil and water conservation. From the discussion that we had again, uh, you realize that there is a lot of water that is needed for avocado, avocado growth, actually. So mulching, some farmers are using uh, a, a mulching and you know the, the importance of mulching, it helps to conserve soil moisture. It also enhances soil fertility as well. Uh, we also have variety selection. People are now going for those varieties that are highly resistant to pests so that they don't use uh, pesticides or other chemicals in their productivity. Uh, also those varieties that will be able to enhance higher yield without ad addition of some other impurities. Then on water efficient irrigation, we realize that some farmers are now using uh, proper technologies. Some are even using sensors, especially for the um, large scale farmers who are now using uh, sensors for water irrigation. Some are using the drip irrigation just to conserve water as part of the sustainable practices under production. When it comes to processing, we, we are talking about reduced wastage. Now, we uh, my colleague just mentioned uh, while we're having a discussion here on when farmers are supposed to harvest the avocado. So the proper timing of avocado is very key because proper timing of the harvesting of that avocado is very key because it helps to reduce the wastage. Because again, if you harvest an avocado that is immature, then you are going to waste most of that avocado and also to accessing the market. So you, you reduce post-harvest loss uh, and also value addition. Then we have uh, on transport and storage, we have the issues of uh, uh, code chain management. Uh, farmers are now trying to uh, work with those uh, uh, companies or organizations. I know we have representatives of some of those organizations here. I've visited some of them in Moranga who have cold chain facilities. So they get uh, avocados and then they store them in those cold, uh, cold chain stores just to enhance the shelf life of uh, avocado. Uh, under marketing, we have issues of traceability and transparency. Now it's very key with the, the buyer has to know exactly where this fruit is coming from. So this element of traceability uh, and also supply chain uh, uh, efficiency. So I'll now move to the challenges, uh, challenges, and the main challenge here 
in ter- under production of avocado, you realize we have uh, issues of pests and disease management. So we need to address the issues of pests, see how we can be able to mitigate pest and disease threats. We are talking about the quality uh, inputs, some f- varieties, some farmers are talking about access to these uh, varieties. Again, it's another challenge. There's also a gap in the adoption of contemporary agricultural practices that could enhance um, productivity. And then there is also the necessity for climate resilience strategies because of uh, the issues of climate change that I just uh, mentioned. Then under uh, processing, you realize that uh, quality control challenges is a bigger issue and especially for us to meet the uh, international standards, then quality is a key. So quality control challenge is a big uh, issue. There's also a gap in initiatives that could enhance the value and marketability of uh, processed uh, avocado. There's a, we need to invest in modern and efficient processing infrastructure. And I think that's one thing that we are actually lacking as a country. And then also we need, uh, there is lack of uh, uh, linkages between the producers and the processors. So we have to foster these strong connections in the supply chain for a more seamless and efficient avocado processing industry in East Africa. When it comes to storage and transport challenges, uh, we also, uh, farmers are also facing, uh, farmers and also processors are facing some of these challenges. I just alluded to some of them. So uh, we have an issue on the protocol. So we have to ensure that there is improved storage uh, protocol so that we don't lose most of our avocados after harvesting. So post-harvest losses is a big, big challenge. Uh, we have to invest in, in infrastructure that will ensure uh, optimal storage uh, conditions. So because of the inadequate cold storage facilities, we have to ensure that we have proper in, uh, infrastructure. And I, I'm happy that some farmers and groups are coming together to, to develop some of this infrastructure uh, uh, to improve the storage. Uh, we also there's also limited awareness of proper storage techniques and so we have to address this communication gap how do we uh, talk to the farmers when they have what kind of uh, uh, storage that it will be required and also the packaging materials so we have to uh, there is lack of suitable packaging materials and therefore availability of suitable packaging materials is very key to prevent spoilage and extend the shelf life of uh, avocado when it comes to marketing, this is where there's a big issue, limited market access uh, and information. So we have to improve on uh, market intelligence systems and enhance access to the global market because this is what we are all targeting. So, uh, and also this is influenced by the inconsistent product quality. So we need to have standardized practices and this, and as a, fortunate mentioned from the East Africa Science and Technology Commission, when it did not address, we, there are various uh, standards that we have to adhere to. And if you don't adhere to some of those standards, then you will not be able to uh, uh, meet or access some of this uh, market. Also, uh, export barriers and regulations, which are, of course, we, we, we are going to mention here. So to enter the EU market, uh, as it was mentioned, you have to ad- adhere to some rigorous quality and food safety uh, regulations. And there are various elements, crucial elements here. You have to adhere to some compliance with certifications. And from the discussions that we had uh, this morning with my colleague, that getting some of these certifications is also expensive to some farmers. It costs very expensive to get some of these certifications. Certif- uh, certifications, uh, implementing uh, contemporary pack houses or developing connections with global purchasers is a, a big uh, challenge. And from the farmers and uh, the exporters, some of the limitations that they face are here, as you can see, delays in transportation, excessive certification requirements, bureaucratic uh, processes in the registration system, uh, the seasonal nature of our crop, uh, the need to ensure quantity and quality standards for avocado sauce from small scale farmers, and also the practice of harvesting immature fruits. So farmers uh, will always go, whenever there is someone who wants to buy uh, avocado and I was in Moranga, they even steal from, from the farmers 
so long as there is someone who is around and trying to buy uh, avocado. So there are people who are going to steal. So because they are stealing, you want to harvest your, your fruit uh, prematurely. So we have to adhere to minimum harvesting quality standards. And for farmers, they have to be uh, informed on some of these minimal uh, harvesting quality standards that are required. Uh, um, more on limitations, inadequate grading and packaging, uh, adoption, lack of the adoption of uh, post-harvest management technologies, we are the slow response to changes in export market preferences, and also the policy uh, matters concerning specific export countries or uh, destination. There's also uh, the storage facilities also lacking, cold rooms at seaports along the shipment uh, uh, and, and also some sh uh, shipment cancellations. Uh, delays resulting from uh, reduced and elevated insurance pr uh, uh, prices due to associated uh, risks. And these are some of the challenges that, of course, the exporters are facing from the discussion that we've had. Uh, despite all these challenges, we also have opportunities, and there are key opportunities that we can use to elevate or upscale the avocado value chain in East Africa and particularly in Kenya. And for farmers, as we mentioned, they come together. Some of them are forming uh, groups. From these groups, they're getting information, they're getting uh, resources, they're getting some uh, um, uh, access to, to credit. So formation of uh, groups is very key, though it was very lowly uh, mentioned. But the key thing is access to financing for small uh, the smallholder farmers, uh, training uh, and capacity. Uh, to build the capacity of farmers so that they are aware of some of these standards that are needed. How can they be able to manage and access the market, use technology for precision agriculture and also adoption of farming uh, technologies that are sustainable. When it comes to processing, we have value addition, uh, training on uh, post-harvest uh, handling and processes. We're also talking about research and development, like what we are currently doing, trying to identify some of the issues and challenges along each and every value chain and coming up with solutions. And solutions are those solutions that are practical. And that's where we have people who are working and who are dealing with these uh, uh, crops, like ourselves who are in this room, to give us practical solutions. So through this research and development, we are able to come up with evidence-informed policies that will be able to be implemented to support our farmers and ensure that the value chain is greatly upscaled and also investment in the processing uh, infrastructure. When it comes to storage, there are key opportunities uh, under the storage also tap into collaboration with logistic companies. Uh, we also need to adopt innovative storage systems for reducing post-harvest losses, establishing robust cold, store, uh, cold chain infrastructure, just to prolong the, the shelf life of this avocado, like I mentioned, uh, collaborating logistic companies I mentioned. And then also there's this uh, interconnectedness of transport and transportation because uh, storage and transportation, because again, farmers are facing a lot of challenges, but I'm happy in most of these areas where we are producing avocado, we have now uh, groups that are trying to support in terms of storage. Counties are even also coming on board to support some of these uh, challenges, farmers to ensure they access uh, storage and also reduce the transportation cost uh, for the farmers. When it comes to marketing opportunities, uh, we have to develop rob robust marketing and branding strategies. So we have to brand our products so that we create a distinct identity for the East Africa avocado. We also need to explore the international market, expand the avocado sales beyond just the regional borders. And I'm happy like for Kenya, we are already there. We also need to establish relationships with retailers to create efficient distribution channels and then compliance with quality and safety standards that I mentioned. And also fortunate mentioned some of these standards, which are key for you to access the, the, the market. Uh, uh, the EU is also one of the key opportunity that we have to tap into. And the, what, what should actually encourage us is that there is very high demand for avocado. Every time, even us in our families on our diet, everyone wants to have a fruit. And most of the time you realize the fruit is avocado. So there's already an increasing demand 
for avocado. So there's market, that means that there is market for avocado. Another good thing is that uh, our production methods are also emphasizing the ethical and environmentally responsible practices. And of course, of course, we know the consumers in the EU market are conscious of some of this uh, sustainability and fair trade awareness. And it is also good that our farmers, our producers, our processors as are also aware of some of these ethical and environmentally responsible practices. So that's a good thing that uh, we encourage. Also acquiring certifications like the organic fair trade, the rainforest alliance. I know they are already here trying to support farmers and working with consumers on uh, uh, certifications. Now for you to get to sustainability, their costs and from the discussions that we had and the literature that we interrogated, uh, there are various constraints that, uh, uh, that are faced to transit to sustainability. And key among it is the financial constraints because you have to, for you to move from uh, the conventional way of doing things to now sustainable ways like organic cultivation, agroforestry, eco certifications, you need money. So for some farmers, for some processors, for some marketers, it's a big challenge. So they face financial constraints. Also training, training farmers is also very expensive. And for those who are doing marketing here, you realize that for you to even train those farmers and groups on, for example, when you are supposed to harvest some of the practices that you are supposed to adopt, it's also expensive because you need to spend money infrastructure like the cold chain infrastructure it's also expensive to 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 of course to establish so those are some of the challenges uh we're also talking about skills uh the new skills and knowledge that is actually needed to get to uh to transit to sustainability so when it comes to policies what are some of the key things that we are talking about it what we want to advocate for one is access to this fi uh, financing for smallholder farmers, because uh, as we mentioned, that's one of the key challenge. And then building their capacity, their capacity to keep them with knowledge, to understand what are those standards that are required uh, uh, that you're supposed to do. If it, when you talk about certification, you talk about ripening. So you have to enhance, build their capacity and also capacity in terms of resources, some of those uh, um, uh, some of those uh, uh, infrastructure that is needed. We also need policies that are that will enhance market linkages uh, for sustainable avocados. So ensuring there is a smooth entry into the market. We are also talking about uh, in climate uh, information. So farmers need to be aware of some of this information. How do we ensure that this information reaches the farmer uh, in the right way? We know there is a lot of climate information out there, but it doesn't get to the, uh, the target uh, group. How do you ensure that this information is translated into products that will be consumed by the farmer? Also clear environmental regulations that will guide sustainable practices and also invest in avocado forecast research and innovation. That's what we are actually doing together with EU, trying to solve some of these challenges and trying to make sure that these challenges get uh, addressed in policy issues uh, and having proper institutions that will be able to support uh, uh, farmers, uh, marketers to get to the EU market and other global markets. And as my colleague mentioned, not just the global market, but you also mentioned talking about the regional market in East Africa, like uh, what ISTECO, the East Africa Science and Technology Commission uh, Executive Secretary mentioned, we also need to impress uh, the region and also trying to enhance mar market within the region and also locally, the domestic market, uh, how we can be able to get to the domestic market and also the issues of inclusivity. So I know as much as we are talking about the value chain and all these uh, key things, we also need to ensure that the needs of women and also the marginalized groups are well adhered to in the policies that we are coming up with. So thank you very much uh, for listening, uh, unless you have any question. So you can speak through the mic. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation there, Dr. Um, Perhaps just to ask, you know, data is key. So do we have a hub for the data and uh, who is the custodian of this data? Thank you. Any other? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. That is really a very insightful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question to, uh, not you, but to Elizabeth. Uh, she did speak about, uh, you know, um, intercropping, you know, giving uh, better results. I was somehow lost in the process uh, because I was wondering, is it intercropping with what? You know, could it be intercropping to mean maybe has vis-a-vis uh, fuete? Could it be has or fuete and maize? It wasn't really, really very clear. So I was actually just very keen to actually appreciate, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the need for that uh, intercropping bit of it. Okay. Maybe to add to answer you. Uh, when I talk of intercropping, it's not a, one variety against the other, but intercropping with other crops. Yeah, it could be maize, it could be legumes. Yeah, generally intercropping with other crops such that you're able to produce the, your avocado simultaneously as you produce your other crops. Thank you. So maybe I can go with the data. I know... Um... Fortunate to have uh, given out the, a very comprehensive answer to this. I know that's work. That's what exactly Isteco is also doing, trying to ensure that. Fortunate, are you online? So just to ensure that this data is uh, available and is uh, used by key stakeholders within the within the the sector. So fortunate, can you respond something? Tell us something about data. Um, thank you, Ruth. Um. Uh, East African community through the uh, MACA project, the second MACA project, uh, have developed uh, a database for uh, ESC export and import data uh, on avocado and coffee. And uh, it is already operationalized. We are now producing reports out of the database. And the uh, and any other auxiliary data that is associated with the with Overkado. So this information is available. I'm going to put the link to the to the chat and the, it can be accessed through the ESC webpage. Thank you. Thank you, Fortunate. Thank you so much. So now I'll hand over to Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Luta and Elizabeth, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I believe uh, that's provided some good insights on the, the avocado value chain in East Africa, which of course, Kenya is one of them. And I believe you all resonate with what was presented in terms of the challenges and the opportunities. So now we will now go into um, the breakout groups where we will deep dive into those challenges and focusing more on the uh, realities on the ground. What we've done is based on literature, combining all the evidence that's, that's out there on the shelf, both from academic and gray literature. Now we want to get your views as well to add to the results that we have, so that we should we have a very comprehensive result as well as a recommendation to overcome those challenges across the value chain. So um, I guess the best approach would be we have three groups. 
one group will focus on production, the next group on the storage and processing, and the third group will deal on the issues of marketing. So I believe I will leave it open for participants to go where they feel comfortable based on their expertise, because I don't want to take a farmer and put the group of market where he or she has nothing to contribute. But if for one reason or another, we have a group that is not well represented, then we will figure out how to, you know, navigate that challenge. So um, I think group one can be, group one on production can be on my right side. Then the group two on processing and storage, far left at the, at the back, and then group three on marketing at the center. So based on your expertise and uh, where you think you can contribute, group one, production, center marketing, far back, uh, center marketing, yeah, far back production and processing. With the presentations from the group work. So the rapporteurs can take us through. The rapporteurs can take us through their findings. So a maximum of five minutes each so that we can move to the next uh, section. We can, if you just, so the rapporteurs, especially those who are writing on the charts or uh, the chairpersons, So we'll start with the producers.
Dr. Sitati, I can start. Uh, before we start, I request we stand. Before we start, I request we stand. Sibi, Yambura. Are we set? You know, some of us have really gotten full, eh? So, can you stretch? Kevo. And this one? Bed? I've not said we sit. Yambu? Embu, bed, when you'll make me to repeat, we can sit. Thank you. On behalf of the winning team, I have this presentation for you. Production challenges, number one, access to the right certified seedlings. Two, the cost implication element, not only to set up the orchard, but the entire value chain is cost-centered. Three, there's a huge knowledge gap around the different varietals around the avocado, seedlings, and even the fruitings. Some of them, we even don't know how to pronounce them. Is it fruit or fute or, or it is which fresh word? Then it is the jumbo or it is the jumbo and all the others. But the main knowledge gap is around not only those varietals, but also a lot of information lacking on the soil health, if not the soil nutrients, that is meant to be the supporter of the different varietals that you are planting. Then there's also the lack of knowledge at the point of transplanting. Who was in the marketing team? Tom, polite question. How many meters for you to transplant? Meters? Yes. I'm talking about spacing. No, for you to transplant the seed ring, how many meters is it supposed to be? Okay, how many feet? How many inches? Oh, you're talking about the, the, the size of the hole? No, the seedling. Oh, okay, the, the, the seedling. Mm. Um, oh, call it the height. Ordinarily, uh, ordinarily beyond the knee, I think is, is okay. Because uh, for as long as that grafting part is actually uh, cured, I think as and when it gets closer to the knee. How many months? Um, how many months? Uh, four months. So how many farmers have that information? How many producers have that information? I hear you. Do they know about their soil health? Calcium? Mm -hmm. Nitrogen? Do they? Do they know the original harsh gold and the fake and the scam? And then the cost of the inputs. And tied to the inputs, the quality of those inputs. We even went political. How genuine? What is the quality standards of the free fertilizer? 
the farm inputs, besides fertilizer, this manure, this the seedling. What is the cost of production in terms of the inputs of those particular orchards? Then, what availability? Then, how are we accessible to those market inputs? And so it puts the orchard in terms of startup capital to be on a higher scale. How about the management of the pests and the diseases? In the first place, do the producers know those pests? Do they even know or have the know-how of the, those diseases? At what point do you harvest? And how do you harvest? And do you have the tools to harvest? And one gentleman trying to describe to us how it is done. I it reminded me of our school days where our parents would wait for the day the school was closed, keep the books, go to the farm. True? Not in your place. This is put in, in different color. Ask the writer, not me. And we said it is because of the current regime. Read it, you'll know. We are in very punitive tax regime. Is it not a challenge? Solutions. Number one, we may want to request the likes of Kelfis to publish a list of the certified nursalis among some of the arms. Number two, most of the challenges that we mentioned are tying in terms of solutions. So we were looking at how the engagement of the right stakeholders can be done to address those challenges. Other challenges were also being tied by a solution of capacity building and empowerment, capacity building and development. Most of the questions I've posed to my brother Tom, you realize he's trying to weigh his mind to get answers to. Not that he doesn't know, but most of the farmers are ignorant of some of the solutions or some of the challenges they have in terms of strategic solutions, if not answers. So calling therefore for a lot of training, a lot of empowerment and uh, exposure. Some of the strategies that we're trying to propose would be one, subsidies, grants, donations, and at times donations in kind of the certified right seedlings. Number two, we need to have a concrete financial master plan. This time involving the right key stakeholders. Three, scheduling of targeted training programs and especially targeting the producer. Tied on that, establishment of centers of excellence that can be used for these training programs, that can be used for exposure. Still, we could have model farms. Musao, what was that farm owned by Chesarems? Right, for instance, we would have that farm as a model farm that the farmers, that the producers can go in and have that training done or get some exposure or get to know the centers of excellence in terms of best practices. A big debate around partnerships and joint ventures so that we are able to brand synergies around strengths and weaknesses so that we are able to grasp the opportunities as we also face head on 
some of the threats. Number four. Because at Wezani Nagava, and especially on things around punitive tax measures, we leave some things as macro variables. But where possible, you can take the EPZ route. And I'm not saying, and I'm not encouraging you to evade taxation, but it is a route that you can take. In conclusion, Kevo, Ukonanguvu Kuniliko, Kuja Nuekei, we had an assignment for the gentlemen and ladies who invited us on this session. So that we observe Wangari Madai's slogan. It is not only about talking. Dig a hole, plant a tree, water it, nurture it, let it grow. So one of our action points is we do have a quarterly review of such a session with key stakeholders. So that we don't leave it here, we go for Christmas and we forget, and I even forget Dr. Addison. What will happen when we meet in heaven? Number two, we may need to explore the carbon credits. Do the producers know about the carbon credits? What's the status? Are they aware? Is there any training? Is there, can it be a revenue stream? Number four, we've got model farms. We've got centers of excellence, like what Mr. Mosawa was suggesting. This environment is saline, excellent, ideal, very good. What of if we found ourselves in a farm, a model farm? We could have eaten a couple of bananas, if not avocados, by now, where we are interacting with the soils, the best practices. People who have already done it, perfected it, where you are being shown this is a scam avocado. This is a certified one. This is a fake one. This is a counterfeit one. Could we consider to do such visits? And courtesy of one of uh, my members of parliament, we've already secured a slot to visit his farm. The rest are not invited. Number four. We cited Del Monte for reasons best known to us. But for some of us who might have visited Thika Road, you realize that they don't have a fence. Sure. And there's no theft of their pineapples. Yet, our number one threat, not challenge, threat of avocados is theft. And you, we put this full stop there. Any question? Yes, understand. Yes. That is why we put it here as an action point for policy. Because we do not want to take the Del Monte route. That if it is not dogs, you have somebody up there, that one. Or who want us. 
So that was team production. Yes. Thank you for that question. Most of the farmers have approached banks. Most of the producers have approached banks. But you find that many of them don't have a tailor-made solutions for them. That is number one. Number two, most of us, we have got pieces of lard that we can use for as collateral. But you find, because there is no existing infrastructure, like now of the orchard, support what I may call repayments of loans, the banks or financial institutions will find us as a risk. So they will not be able to tie in that with a loan or with a, with a facility. The government has been watching. It's not there. It's not existing. Same to other financial institutions apart from the banks. So as a policy framework we were looking at if there can be deliberate and intentional conversations around a policy framework that can establish financial master plans that zeroes on a high value club like avocado and with proper synthesization of the right stakeholders we were seeing like we would make a breakthrough Local investors, yes. International, yes. But on a round table like this one, where we have a convergence of ideas and synergies put together. This course currently there exists none. There was a mention of equity bank. They have been trying, but they still find agriculture and especially for avocado for startup as a risk. So they don't want to be involved right from the onset. They want to come in when you have struggled at the latter years, when you're almost going to, you know, that hole, eh? when you don't need them or you already perfected your art. Why didn't they start with you right from the initial stages where you're able to craft and coin a plan that you can work with? Again, it's the background that we are seeing. This is more of a cap very capital intensive uh, project and especially when you are doing it for commercial. And once again, you are also looking at making returns. You not make returns if you are talking of small acreages. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, just one. So we are we are limited the time. First and two. Okay, uh, thank you very much, you know, for that very good presentation. You're welcome. I think uh, the financial institutions do not understand the value chain, so probably we might pump a lot of pressure so that they get to understand the, the significance and the contribution of the value chain to the economy. But what I want, also wanted just to add is that uh, at the nursery establishment level, you spoke very well about the clean planting materials, which is fine. Certified nurseries. Uh, I know uh, HCD. Uh, we've got a list of certified nurseries. Uh, presently, I think just about 78 listed in their website. So you can imagine the whole country, but we have got several, several nurseries. So I agree with you that certified nurseries should actually be accessed through CAFIS or HCD. But again, the establishment of mother blocks as a source of scion, I think this is something we also need to consider. I know Calro has got uh, about three mother blocks for the whole country, but I think that is not enough. We need to perhaps also have a discussion around the establishment of mother blocks as a source of science to these nurseries. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Tom. And that is why, thank you. And that is why you ended up having this checklist of the AOB. And uh, Cynthia is my witness. Cynthia, where are you? Yes. 
where we were politely but harshly requesting or pinning her down to ensure the next quarterly evaluation that is spearheaded by say it is involving the key stakeholders the key stakeholders we are talking about are the kings and the carols of this world why not the peers of the related um, industry of avocado if it's not agriculture they may not do anything but they get to know the action points that are being put forth so that if the ina bills or any engagements that they may want to take at the government or ministerial level they can take but we are looking at this is an engagement of a conversation that may not stop here but may need to be driven to the next level where everybody is brought on board peter or you want to be here again next year and you are in the same hall yeah that's why i said i start with the winning team thank you You're let's welcome. clap for them thank you so we now move to processing and storage 5 minutes please as they get organized there is a form that is going around just indicate the area of operation or your office location where we can easily find good afternoon everyone i have 5 minutes and i'm representing the processing and storage um group um I'm Rose Moshisho and I'm happy to be here. These are the challenges that we picked from the group. Um the first challenge was quality control. So basically we looked at all the challenges that had been listed from the presentations and then we tried to prioritize the ones that we felt were based on priorities. So the first one we saw was quality control. Um of, of course that affects I think we all understand the quality of the product. um of the avocado the second one is insufficient linkage between the producers and the processors i think we discussed the fact that 80% of the 80% of the fruit that is exported is exported by 20% of the exporters so the question was how do we increase this number because the other 80% of the exporter also want fruit so we need to find a way of um linking the processors with the pro pro producers who are also quite many um then the uh, the third one was post harvest losses due to poor storage and inadequate uh, um cold storage i think the issue was um people, the farmers they had we will harvest and then the fruit stays on the farm maybe 2 3 days before it gets of course that means the quality of the fruit is also affected so then you have lots of um losses after you've harvested the the fruit the other one is lack of information and high cost of cold storage facilities just following that one closely and then finally is lack of capacity building and support to the brokers um we felt that the brokers or the middlemen are very instrumental because they work with small scale farmers they also work with some with large farmers but they help to bridge the gap between they help with b the insufficient linkage thanks so in terms of solutions um for the first one when which was about quality um we looked at farmer training uh and compliance 
in terms of post-service production and post-service handling. The farmers need training to understand how to handle the fruit, how to harvest. And then, of course, besides the training, they need equipment. Some of the farmers may not have access to the tools or the equipment or even the PPEs for harvesting so that they don't throw the, the, the fruits on the ground. Can they have bugs and all that? Then, of course, when you, when you look at equipment, you're also looking at dry matter testing because of um, maturity. This is also something that could be explored as a solution. Um, third, we talked about value addition of rejects because we have rejects on the farm that you leave behind because they're not good quality. But then there's also rejects after processing. So we those rejects, could we could look at having value addition for them in terms of crude oil. And um, I think we were talking about puree and other products that we could look at. Then of course, integrated pest management to minimize the reject. Um, the other one would bring cold storage solutions closer. I think I've mentioned this when I talked about the quality of the fruit when it's harvested. Then we have pay for good quality. I think the question here was, um, if you invest, say, in a, in the cold room, maybe from the farm all the way up, there is no incentive. So you find that, uh, that, that for the processor, they have different brands, but then there is the, that the 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 is not able to get a good price if they they invest in the in the cold in the cold chain. So the the quest the, the solution we're looking at is for premium quality service, if there could be then a price that then matches what the investment is in terms of cold room, in terms of just being able to put up a good good product. Then the other one is setting standard prices for international markets. I think here we're looking at, um, we, we see the role of Avocado Society of Kenya where they, they share prices of, uh, currently they share prices in terms of what the prices are at the pack house. So we're trying to see, can we have the same system where we have prices being shared for international markets so that then everybody knows the good quality product costs this much, that kind of thing. Then in terms of insufficient linkage between producers and processors, um, the solutions we're proposing were information access. Um, I think one thing we saw is uh, the use, of course, of social media, the use of um, technology to disseminate information. So we need to upscale this. We are doing a good job, but we need to reach more farmers or producers in terms of enabling them to access information. Another thing is extension support from the exporters. I think we're looking at how do we provide extension even for the farmers as exporters so that then the farmers are able to to know what it is they need to to know like uh, our the, the the person who was produced was um presenting earlier said um the other one is aggregation centers closer to the farmers. I think for this we're looking at being able to maybe provide a center where the farmers are able to access the cold room, they're able to access um, this is just collection center that could maybe, I, I had him talking about an, a center of excellence that then allows the farmer to be able to pull their resources, the small scale farmers, and then be able to um, access the, the processors. So I think that we saw that as a possible solution. The last solution was on high cost of storage. I think we're looking at a rent to own model for this cold storage facility. So what we're looking at is um, having farmers um, pull together and then you're able to either deduct from how they are, they are using, the either they are supplying and then you can be able then to pay for the what's it called, the cold storage or whatever it is that you're supplying them. So we're looking at that as a possible solution. Then um, the other one is training farmers on the entrepreneurship. I think this one we discussed the fact that um, in as much as we are putting farmers in groups, sometimes farmers um, disappoint in terms of you expect them to supply you a certain volume and then when you go, the volume is not there. But because they don't have the 
commercial um, savviness to know that if they commit to five turns, then they have to supply. So we're looking at if we could have them trained on entrepreneurship so that they understand the business sense of it, then they can be able to supply and be able also to take up some of this um, infrastructure for themselves as a business also. So in terms of lack of capacity building for the brokers, um, I think well, we looked at registration by the relevant government agencies. I think that's already there, but I think it's not enforced. We still don't have all of them registered. So I think the idea was having, um, what did we call it? But brokers or good conduct, you know, like brokers who are, are able to follow and do the right thing. So that kind of, uh, so registration for those brokers. Then they're also, of course, training the brokers, but also training the exporters because we felt like sometimes the processors themselves don't even know about quality. So it's good to train them on the same then the other one is equipping them as well as the way we talked about harvesters, equipping them with harvesting tools and then also access to finance. Like he said, I think for us also that was an issue. We need finance that's tailor-made to the processors or these people at the middle, but that's not there at the moment. I think the story he said is a story we repeated here as we had our discussions. Mm, yeah, I think... I think we have four strategies for implement. Okay, not more more than four um, strategies for implementing. I think the first one was tailor-made financing. I think I've mentioned that for each value chain actor. The second one was capacity building on business plans. I think he mentioned that. But for us also was how much, um, what's the plan for either aggregating, what's the plan for processing so that then it allows you to access financing. The other one is the rent to own models, like I mentioned. Um, the other one is training and equipping the youth at the community level to offer support services to farmers. I think we saw that as an opportunity for, for the, every, everyone that is involved to work with the youth at the community to then offer those as, a, as, a, as an employment, um, yeah, as an employment opportunity. So the other one was, of course, incorporating technology and innovation. So we're looking at um, a number of technologies that we could use. I think this was ethylene inhibitors, dry matter testing. So technologies that could be used really to just make it easier to, to know what is happening either on the farm. So then you could also predict what is going to happen, whether you're going to have fruit or not, the, those kinds of technologies. Then the other one was data on harvest. If we could have data on harvest trends in the different regions, I think that was probably for HCD, HCD, so that then we can be able to know who is starting when, but then based on data, not just based on, uh, so it comes up as a, uh, based on the data. Also data on the different um, producing regions, data on the farmers on, from, from all the other regions. Then I think the last one was stratification of exporters and processors. I think here we were looking at how we can have the exporters, like the, we, we were talking about like Alibaba, the way they have gold, you know, that kind of thing that then allows us to, or even people from outside to know who is a good quality, who's, who's appearing to certain standards. And therefore whoever is appearing is able to also command a better price. And then that way it sort of like regulates and uh, creates a, allows there to be co fair competition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any clarification? If not, I'll move to the marketing group. If you can take only five minutes, I'll appreciate.
Thank you very much. So challenge number one was about uh, 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 inability to access uh, quality fruits that made uh, export uh, specifications. And of course, uh, sub supply chain uh, instability. The supply of fruit is actually in, in, in consistent, making it difficult you know, to meet the demand. And of course, also going uh, alongside that is about um, uh, immature fruits, which is basically a housekeeping uh, issue. The solution to this is adherence to good agricultural practices. And of course, uh, attaching good prices to high quality uh, fruits. Now the strategies to be implemented is uh, organizing and offering certification and market adherence my goodness, no, really, we're talking about uh, you know, organizing farmers into groups. And uh, after uh, organizing farmers into groups, then we have the farmers uh, get certified, uh, for example, global, global gap option two for producer organizations or global gap option one for the exporter. So that basically then uh, addresses the issue of quality. Alongside that is uh, post-service management uh, of avocados right uh, from the farm to the processing uh, facilities. And that goes alongside the entire cold chain, cold, cold chain management that then ensures that the temperatures at the farm level are the temperatures uh, during transportation. And at the same time, those are the temperatures that are then avocado arrives with at the processing uh, facility. Then challenge number two is, of course, theft of the fruit, which is actually uh, a big, big, big uh, problem. But we are saying that uh, we need to ensure that buying of fruits is actually done strictly on the farm and strictly from the farmers to actually ensure that we arrest the menace of uh, theft. Uh, because with theft, actually, uh, it's, a, it's actually a very big problem in the industry and it, it, it actually impacts very, very badly and portrays the image of the Kenyan avocado also uh, very badly. Now, solution in terms of strategy is law enforcement to promote controlled buying procedures. Uh, the solution that we're saying that let avocados be bought and let people interact uh, in the day. And of course, uh, finally, and most importantly, is organizing farmers into effective uh, producer organizations. Number three, is lack of disability of the Kenyan avocado as it arrives into the international uh, arena. The solution for this, of course, is also to organize farmers into producer groups so that we can actually be able to say with certainty that avocado fruit X is actually coming from producer organization, say in Meru, and in Meru, it's actually coming from this particular region and also possibility of actually tracking it down to the level of the farmer that actually has sold that uh, avocado. So the strategy we are saying that we map and organize farming farmers into groups and then link the farmers with the marketing persons to ensure that what actually arrives into the pack house is, is exactly what came uh, from the farmers. And finally, last but not least, is contract enforcement. Uh, excuse us for the typo, contract enforcement. We have contracts, yes, but the implementation of the contracts is actually a big problem. So number five is the fact that the prices that the Kenyan exporter gets is actually dictated to by the buyers. So that actually uh, jeopardizes the opportunities that are actually available within the international uh, market uh, space. So to mitigate against this, we are talking about uh, you know uh, timely uh, market intelligence to the extent that we are actually able to say that this particular market, this is actually the price that is is offering. And if assuming we are talking about Peru, we are talking about Mexico, we are talking about Colombia, this is the price that their uh, avocados is actually attracting at the international market. And of course, attach premium price to quality. Uh, produce as an incentive for the farmers to be able to produce to the market high quality fruits. Strategy, access to timely market information, and of course also marketing directly to the buyers. We are actually suggesting that exporters then um, um, uh, negotiate and sell directly to the uh, buyers out there. And of course also uh, to bring that uh, element, oh sorry, I think, uh, I the final one is about, uh, you know, to be able to mitigate against, you know, the, the exporters being uh, price takers, we are suggesting a solution in respect to participation in the international trade fairs. 
The reason why I'm emphasizing on this is that at the international trade fairs, the exporters are in a position to interact directly with the buyers, one-on-one -on, -one on a table, and then they negotiate uh, prices uh, outside of uh, you know uh, email communication and phone conversations. Then finally is changes in market regulations, market, uh, market and standard regulations. Each and every single time we hear what was actually uh, required of us, the regulation that was required of us last year actually changes this year. So quite a number of changes are actually coming out of the uh, European Union that we're talking about. And of course, also the impact of, of Brexit has equally also uh, somehow impacted on, on some of these uh, standards. So the changes in market regulations every now and again, even if you had to speak about uh, the global gap certification, you remember they keep on changing global, global, global gap improved to a certain level, the one that was actually we are supposed to adhere to last year actually changes this particular year. So, where are you? Okay, sorry. The solution is about adaptability. Businesses have to adapt to these market changes for them to actually be able to sustain themselves into this uh, market. Strategy is also, of course, about access to market information and, of course, you know, to uh, to, to the changes in these uh, regulations. And, of course, uh, the regulatory authorities. Here we are talking about... Um, uh, KFEs, HCD, and of course also business management organizations, they need to collect and disseminate information as and when it is available. And I hope Anas is taking notes. Okay, sawa sawa. So um, again, the other challenge is about delays in checks and clearance for exporters. Example is about, uh, you know, regulators, KFEs, HCD, and KRA taking um, a little bit of longer time, you know, to clear the exporters to be able to have their shipments uh, exit either JKIA or uh, the port uh, of Mombasa. But for this, the solution is that uh, the BMOs need to work, work very closely with the regulators so that they lobby and they uh, actually appraise the regulators on the instance of speedy uh, clearance of the goods because we are talking about, uh, you know, perishables. Um, Strategies, organizing and offering certification to markets and adherence to market standards. That should be the, 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 the implementation strategy. And then the high cost of marketing. High cost of marketing, why? Uh, you know, uh, you are talking about a market that is not available here. You go to travel to Europe, you go to engage those people in that part, part of the world. So that is actually a major, major uh, constraint. But what you are saying is that uh, if you could create a financial vehicle, that support exporters to be able to participate in international trade fairs, then that then arrests the issue of the cost of uh, you know uh, marketing. And of course, uh, in terms of strategy, you create partnership between financial institutions and exporters for them to be able to access finances to, be, to mitigate the high cost of marketing. Harvesting cost is equally uh, a major uh, issue, uh, either at cost level or at the operational level but you're suggesting that uh, we build the capacity of the harvesters in terms of uh, uh, proper harvesting techniques so that then the fruit that gets out of the farms is that only which meets the market specifications how do you uh, implement this you may stream the youth into the avocado farming so that the, it is actually the youth who are empowered and equipped with the right skills to be able to offer uh, harvesting uh, operations at the farm level with those few remarks, Asante Nisana. Pardon? I just wanted to add something on the harvesting cost. It's not just on the part of the farmer, but also demands by the buyers. Huh? Some of the buyers from the smallholder farmers. They have weird demands, like bring your crop to us 100 kilometers away. Yeah. And they have to harvest and they have to use transport. Yeah, that is part of And it is happening. So let's not lose that point. And we have some of the dominant companies in Kenya, the Kakusis of the day and the others. They put such weird demands. Even in Moranga, farmers have to transport uh, and fight transport. And uh, they find they can't meet that kind of cost. And so they leave their fruit to the 
to the brokers. These are the realities of the ground which we have to face here. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Jen was actually part of the team. Uh, Peter, uh, really, you're okay. part of the team, so I basically also just want to appreciate you people. I have, I, have a question. I, have, I have a question, Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, on that marketing issue, why, would, would I think you would have, would have touched on payments for the exporters? The way they, did you touch on payments? Payments. Uh -huh. How they how they receive their payments from from the people they export to? Because that, that's a, that's a very big challenge. Uh, you, you you are absolutely right. Uh, because uh, um, we were not able to exhaust virtually everything. But you have a point. Exporters have got a story to tell whether big or small, because out there we have fraudsters, right? So there's a very big challenge. I think the last time I checked, uh, HCD has a very big file of uh, exporters complaining of non-payments. The challenge then is that a number of exporters do go and lobby the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but they can only do so much. So quite a number of exporters have actually lost money. So I agree with you. That is actually something you also need uh, you know, to factor in here non-payments by the importers, right? Could I also add uh, another point there on harvesting costs? At the farmer's level, there is uh, delayed payments. Once they take their produce to these big companies, then they have to wait to be paid, you see? So there's a lot of exploitation. So you find the farmers are not accessing the markets and uh, everybody is trying to make as much money as they can as exporters but where is the farmer who is farming the fruit jen as part of the Thank team you very actually much. it was a it was a debate and uh somehow we could not agree but uh jen has actually said that uh farmers uh their payment delay uh for two weeks and some of us were saying that uh two weeks is not bad enough but uh at least uh, we need to basically incorporate that and is agree. A point, and that is a reality because the farmer has already been told, bring the harvest 100 kilometers away, then you keep the payment for two, even three weeks. So these are some of the things that need policy push. I think the government needs to step in, put a regulation. You have to pay within this time limit. This kind of exploitation has to come to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jen, you, and I can assure the point is actually taken. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so you speak through the mic, you press the speak button. Um, we also had that point in our group so I would, I would like to clarify, is it really exploitation? Because what we discovered is um, because of the international reputation of Kenyan avocados, buyers are not paying upfront as they used to. So before you'd get, they would pay you a down payment of up to 50%. Now that is not happening. So the exporter has to wait until payment comes. So this trickles down all the way down to the farmer. So it's not actually exploitation if we look at the entire value chain. Yes, I do understand farmers need to be paid, <laughs> but um, maybe let's be realistic in the timelines we set. Yeah. That's not it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, it's a very interesting debate. I would have loved if uh, there are issues of non-payments. Uh, uh, from where I sit, two weeks is okay. Uh, from where I sit, two weeks is okay. Because there are logistics uh, of you know, processing payments. Avocados have actually arrived. They've got to be inspected. And remember, for those in the industry, you know only too well that uh, uh, not everything that the farmer deposits at the park house is actually taken. Because exporter will actually sort and grade and pays will pay for only which that one that passes the test. Now, by the time you finish that and then you key it in, and you've got maybe on that particular day about 50 of them or 10 of them the following day like that. You know, you can go to appreciate that this moves then to the accounting department for processing. So it might be able to take a while. Um, but again, 
I know there are issues of uh, non-payments. <clears throat> that is there. I've uh, you know, come across the issues of non-payment of the farmers by the exporters. Um, but when it comes to commercial disputes, you know, uh, the, 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 the contracts actually should actually then be able to address these issues. And uh, if they cannot be sorted out uh, amicably, then they can proceed and maybe look for an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Dr. Tari. Um, just to add on to, so basically, um, the reason why there's a contract between the exporter and the farmer is just so that it's a win-win situation. I'm a bit surprised that the exporters who are not paying the farmers, but um, really, I think the contract binds both parties. And uh, yes, I totally agree with the fact that uh, the farmers used to be paid beforehand 100%. But now it's a situation whereby the price now is being dictated by the customer. So you wait and see. Well, just like all businesses, it's a risk. And we are all in this risk. The farmer, who is the backbone of what we do. Thank you very much. I could add, uh, please, one more point around harvesting cost is on uh, poor road network. Poor road network, and this need to get to government. Yes, because uh, it just increases the cost of harvesting. So roads need to be improved, even grading. Yeah, just make them motorable so that it reduces the cost of harvesting. And to, yeah. And actually, so we have uh, the next session is actually on trade. So we want to look at trade barriers, both for domestic, regional, and the global market. So I can see this discussion has already ushered us into that particular session. And I can see we have uh, how many minutes? Um, we only have 20 minutes. So I don't know. <laughs> Very last one. So we only have uh, three. Very briefly. Yes. I want to do a very small add to what Peter said. For the potential producers, Tom at times we will call it desperate sale. Allow me to request as a producer that you are also doing a binding contract that has some very clear cut spell out clauses, which include and not remitted to payments. And you read between the lines and understand the cross of payments. You mutually agree how many days or how many months before you can talk about being exploited and especially when we are talking about the international export market. Thank you. Um, uh, if I could say something about our presentation, uh, I'd like to thank Tom for doing a good job. One of the key barriers to marketing our avocados is the quality of fruit a section of the exporters are sending out. So production and uh, how we handle the fruit once it's been harvested really plays a role in us securing a better price and a bigger market for our crop. For example, um, mid this year, we had a very co good command of the Chinese market Unfortunately, we lost it to Peru uh, just because our quality couldn't match Peru's quality. Mm -hmm. And a few years back, Peru was a nobody in the avocado market. Today, they are going into our traditional markets and actually displacing Kenya. So the quality of fruit that we send out, and it has to do with how we grow it and how we handle it, and it's mainly to do with compliance with the current uh, regulations and rules, plus education. So such seminars 
and more education of from the farmer to the harvesters to anyone handling the fruit will help us with marketing. Thank you, Thank you very much, Maridhi. Now, uh, like I said, and of course, those are very good points that I've, uh, you've brought out. So we are actually looking at uh, trade barriers. You've mentioned some of them. You've also given us some of the strategies. So what I'd request because of the, the interest of time, if you can think of some of the trade barriers uh, for accessing the domestic market, the regional market, regional market, in this case, we are looking at the East Africa region and then the international market, what are some of the barriers and then what are some of the strategies, if you can just write down in your notebook some of these and then we can move around. So you just uh, put your speaker on and then you can tell us some of those key trade barriers that you are that we are facing at the domestic, regional or international market. So just write it down and then you can switch on your speaker once you have the point and how we can improve on those barriers. And then we have our kid, not take us, Elizabeth and uh, Cynthia, who will capture all, all that. I'm happy to start with the last one, the international yes. one. Yes. May I? So um, while we appreciate the new markets that are being opened up by the uh, government, I think there is need to also involve the businesses when it comes to discussions about why trade with those particular countries. And I'll give an example. India. In the last two years, we uh, conducted a trial for avocados into India. I'm glad that uh, my brother Ernest Motom is here. And um, we realized only too soon that um, neither the government from this side or the Indian uh, High Commission had any idea of how these bilateral issues can be captured. Long story short, fast forward, the government has um, opened up the Indian market, but Kenya has not started uh, exporting. Reason being that we are considered a developing country. And so um, we are subjected to a 30% duty once the shipment is inbound India. We're having a bit of a challenge with the commercial team on uh, how to price the avocado from this end. But we were very excited because India is the largest population in the world. So um, businesses that have recently moved within the region, i.e. Tanzania, which is considered a least developed country, is exempted from the 30% duty. So last week we got wind that His Excellency is going to India and first on the list was that request to relook at how these bilateral agreements and arrangements can be discussed at government levels and probably at a WTO area whereby it can be a win-win situation. Businesses want to do business. The BMOs are supporting us. And ASOC is in the first front with Buona Ernest, Muthiomi. And we would encourage that when these discussions are the forefront, businesses are also on the table so that they can discuss a strategy and how to overcome these barriers. When that is done, then of course, the appetite will be there. Sorry, it was a mouthful, but just pick the pain points. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, when you speak through the mic, we are able to record it. So for that observation, any other? Could be domestic, regional, international barrier. 
uh, I could uh, add some points here. Um, domestic, there is the poor road network. And uh, so that uh, hinders many farmers from participating in uh, to access markets. And so they are left at the mercy of cartels. Um, I don't know whether, yeah, at domestic, there is poor governance and corruption. You know, this is so pervasive in Kenya because I always wonder how do these immature fruits, how do they find their way at the international market? I mean, I don't understand because we have the regulators here. There are people to check even at the airport. Yeah. So this is corruption. It is so pervasive everywhere in Kenya at all levels. The farmer, I mean, at the, maybe even at the park house. I don't know how, I don't know. This is something we have to face and uh, see that it, it is a big problem in Kenya. Poor governance. This has to be faced and discussed by all stakeholders how this need could be addressed. Um, then there is the unreliable markets for accruing prices due to oversupply uh, at the international level. Uh, disorganized uh, local mar uh, market infrastructure. The farmers are not organized into farmers groups to be able to access a uh, market. Uh, there is a point we made in our groups that uh, where the farmers are organized, I mean, they are able to trace the people who are harvesting immature fruits. So uh, this, this is something that could be done more to organize the farmers. Then there is inadequate institutional uh, support in terms of training, credit for the farmers, uh, even at regional level, yeah. Even at uh, national level in Kenya, there is lack of support. There are so many meetings and a lot of talking. I know the somebody say that I don't know how many counties farmers are being organized, but how far is that? What, what progress is being made in this? So I don't know which structure can work with government closely to know what is happening so that the gaps can be identified and the support can be given to that project. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jen. I hope that's well captured. Uh, maybe I can also add on the on the domestic market. I think there's also an issue of packaging and standardization. So that then you have, for example, currently even for the for the local varieties, they are packaged in sacks. Eh? And of course that affects the quality and all. So I think there there should be um, a way to help to improve that then of course there's the cold storage is no it doesn't it, it just like it's non-existent in the local market so i think this would would help improve the ability of either the farmers or the um, aggregators to then be able to to supply the local market thank you thanks Okay, sorry, I stepped out briefly. So I'm not so sure that I'll be repeating what could, probably could have been touched. Um, the domestic market. Um, uh, the ability of the farmer to access this market is of almost nil. Because um, if you're talking about avocados holistically, uh, without actually minding uh, the variety, specifically when you talk about the domestic market, a farmer, say, from Kisi, is not likely to succeed in entering, uh, say, the Wakulima market. Why? 
because of the way the market system is actually arranged. Uh, some people call them cartels, but I have interacted with them and I realize they're actually just some sort of organization within some of these markets that needs to be adhered to. So that uh, market entry is a problem. But in terms of uh, strategies to improve this, uh, if we have farmers organized into their own produce organizations, then at the, co the, the, the produce organization level, then they negotiate uh, with the gatekeepers of, uh, say, Chuele Market in Bungoma, Kibuye in Kisumu, Nairobi here, uh, Nyeri, uh, Kongwe in Mombasa for purposes. It is easier for the PO to negotiate with the gatekeepers of this market. That is at the fresh produce level. At the retail chain level, here we are talking about the kind of food, the chandalanas uh, of this world. For the farmer to get into this market is not easy because one, you've got to be a registered business, two, you got to have a PIN certificate, ETC. So we need to create awareness as a strategy to breaking this so that the farmer produce organizations also have these documentations done for them to be able to get into this uh, uh, retail chains. Thank you. Something else comes into mind. Whilst we appreciate the stringent measures from the international markets, could we persuade the international market to do away with the use of methyl bromide for avocados? You know, I mean, uh, if our competitors are not able to, you know, carry on in that direction, we, we, we are finding it a little bit from a food safety angle that, um, you know, and ours is to persuade because um, remember, we, we are on the other end. And, uh, you know, if we can get the right persons to, you know, communicate this, it would be very much appreciated. Thank you. I cannot leave without uh, thanking my brother uh, for mentioning the issue of methyl bromide. This is actually a controlled chemical, okay? Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I think it's a major barrier. Remember, uh, His Excellency, um, the immediate past president, himself went to China, I think, uh, for 2020, 2019. Mm -hmm. I'm not very sure, but some, some time there. And they negotiated. And the agreement was that we get into the Chinese market through um, what we call it. No, 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 no. The first one into the Chinese market. Frozen, frozen avocados. Thank you so much, Peter. Frozen avocados. I can tell you for sure the cost of, in, of, of investing in this the in, in infrastructure was equally a very significant barrier. That is one. Number two, you get into the Chinese market with the frozen avocados. You have invested heavily and you are given a very poor price. Okay. So this is actually something that we need to think about. So then later on, then the Chinese people come up with what? Fumigation, methyl bromide. And they know very well that this is a controlled, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemical. Really, can Europe accept a, a processing facility that has applied methyl bromide to supply their market? Apana, Watakata. So this is actually a very serious issue that needs to be addressed very seriously. And I don't know what maybe Ernest would say about the element of methyl bromide. Yes, I think uh, methyl bromide is, is, is a restricted product. I mean, you know the issues about the ozone layer and all that. And uh, methyl bromide is highly toxic. I mean, when we are talking about COP28, according to the Montreal Protocol, this is a, a product that is uh, not allowed to be used. So when such requirements come, and I want to thank my friend, Jonjo here saying some of the players are not involved when this is done. Yeah. Well, we put up a request through KEPSA that when president goes to negotiate with the Chinese uh, prime minister that we get the tariff, zero tariff. I, I don't know whether they've been able to achieve that. We're waiting to hear from the delegation that left. So these method from my requirements and other SPS requirements that come along uh, 
are of course trade barriers. So for me and from where we sit, we are very opposed to something that is not, um, I mean, something that is not good for the human beings is also not good for the environment because uh, there is the risk of contamination with methyl bromide. And then um, some of this methyl bromide that is being used in this country might not be legal, might not be legally registered. Then their purity is also questionable. Uh, the application as well, we found that uh, methyl bromide has been subjected to uh, some percentages that um, have an effect on the quality of the fruit, on the appearance. This also protocol about uh, fumigation, making people get fruits out of uh, the way we prepare our fruits, put them in the cold chain or subject them, them to a cold chain uh, from where we are harvesting and then later on putting them under high temperatures. Of course, it means some of these arguments or some of these protocols were signed without uh, the private sector in, 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 in sight. So just like he's saying that uh, the private sector needs to be involved when some of these protocols are being negotiated. Because you might be told you have a market, but then practically assessing that market is another problem. Of course, when they talk about uh, barriers to trade, I'm still uh, hoping my colleagues, I mean, uh, people here present will still discuss more about market access. So a trade barrier probably would want to sell our fruits to Japan, and then we can't do that because the government has negotiated a protocol with them. It has to have a trade agreement. Sometimes these are political decisions that we involve give and take. So those are, of course, trade barriers that we, we are discussing now. But I want to thank uh, my colleagues. We are trying to see what really we can do with this methyl bromide because so far, the markets that have demanded for a methyl bromide treatment is becoming very difficult for us. It's becoming a trade barrier. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Those are some of the aspects of sustainability that we're actually trying to address. Any other point? Please feel free to switch on your mic. All points okay. are valid. Oh, thank you. Maybe mine, uh, maybe because I we need to get uh, aware about this methyl, this chemical. Methyl bromine, huh? So, what is the purpose? What is the benefit from the other user that you need to use it? Okay, I think why because uh, again, you know why the chemical? It is toxic. Toxic, yes, we know that. But why should we go? You know to use it. So I think, again, the biggest problem we have here, it is about uh, capitalism. So it is about what you are making at your head. So uh, you find that uh, most of the user, nobody cares about the, the user, uh, you know, sometimes. Let me say that. Uh, just maybe uh, to, uh, to make it symbolic, the other day we are, you know, the, the vegetable oil was uh, not good for the human consumption. Overnight, it is good, very good. You can use it. So you see. So actually, there's a lot that we need to know about the, some of these uh, chemicals. Not just that, other chemicals that are also used along the production process. Uh, that, that also need to be, you know, uh, to be, uh, maybe around to be discussed about. Because uh, of, of uh, one of the factors that is driving the market, you know, of the ma avocado globally is the, the people have known the, the benefits of eating avocado. Then we cannot have it like the one again that is carrying the, those toxins to our body. So it is a discussion that, that should go on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I like the fact that we are talking about uh, the East African region. 
And if you talk about the East African region, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, specifically because uh, some of these are the countries that are doing uh, avocados, uh, you realize that our systems are actually different, right? Uh, our systems are different to the extent that you can actually be able to say probably safely that uh, it is possible for the East African region to supply avocados 90% uh, of the year, or if not 100% uh, of the year. But then um, if you look at the port of Dar es Salaam, it is not as sophisticated as Mombasa in terms of uh, places where the containers are taken to uh, cooling purposes before they actually load, loaded onto uh, you know, uh, the vessels uh, going uh, overseas. Now, a number of Kenyan uh, uh, exporters have actually tried to uh, access, uh, uh, you know, to do business uh, in, um, in Tanzania. But of course, the normal challenges uh, they actually uh, face uh, at the port level because the port is not as sophisticated as ours. And that has actually made uh, some of them to lift avocados from Tanzania to Kenya, but of course uh, with challenges because uh, they bring them into Kenya and export them as Kenyan produce. So that's actually a challenge because of uh, uh, the issues of produce uh, origin. So therefore, uh, at, the, at the regional level, if it would be possible for, say, the Kenyan exporter or the Tanzania exporter to work directly with the Kenyan exporter, with the Kenyan producers, they have a, a contract such that if, say, uh, an exporter X in Kenya has got a pharma group in Jombe area in Tanzania, they can then be able to ship avocados from Tanzania, process it in Kenya, but of course, let's declare it that it is actually a Tanzania, a Tanzanian avocado processed and exported uh, from Kenya. But at the moment, that is actually not very clear. So you can't trace it. So, I'd like to comment on the on some of the trade barriers uh, that we face domestically. Uh, one of them, I'd say, says. So we find that uh, if you're harvesting avocados from uh, a county like Meru, it will have to pass through several counties to get to uh, to maybe Tika or Mombasa Road where they're being processed for export. So you find that each and every county that you're passing uh, will charge you uh, some sales, some sales fee, which in, ta uh, in turn increases the cost of uh, doing business. So this um, will also translate to the price that you are quoting outside there. So I believe uh, it's one of the trade barriers. And another thing is the long processes involved when you're uh, applying for an export license. You need to engage with so many institutions for you to be able to export, which uh, becomes a challenge for new entrants into the industry. Uh, another one is uh, climate instability. So sometimes uh, we are faced by drought. Right now we are faced, we are faced by floods. So you're not able to tell how much uh, you you are to expect in terms of uh, production. Uh, going on to the international uh, trade barriers, I think uh, our international buyers have some high level uh, standards, uh, which uh, let's assume you're a new exporter, you need to uh, part with a lot of money to get these standards. When do this person has not done business uh, or has not done uh, any business to be able to raise this uh, amount of money and you're required to part with like a million shillings just on 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 certifications. So I believe uh, this is uh, a barrier to trade to some of the new and uh, maybe small businesses that want to enter into the avocado avocado trade so another 
barrier I'd say is uh, we have talked about the China and the India market. So you find that some of the requirements for you to be able to export to those markets are actually not even doable. So my friends talked about fumigation. There's also the India market, which gives you another option to do cold treatment of which you're, you're to put avocados after processing for zero degrees uh, for 10 days. Uh, another option is for 1.1 degrees for 12 days. You find that if you do that to these avocados, uh, you're actually uh, interfering with the quality of the avocado. So uh, generally when you send it out there, you're not, uh, it's actually not of the best quality. Thank you. On the sales fees, because I think, again, at the end of the day, so we'd like to really have, um, make sure that we write something that really, uh, that we can easily address. So for the sales fees, because I understand this is how counties are also generating revenue, what will be the solution? Like, what can we do? Can I go? Yeah. Yeah, I think we had this discussion before, and uh, thank you so much for that. Basically, you know, it's all about trying to build relationships and working together with the government, with the central government. And um, remember, as businesses, we are not saying that we are not going to pay the cess. No. What we are pleading with the administration is that this should be pegged from the county of origin so that it's a win-win situation. And the only thing that this can be made to happen is if the Council of Governors, the chair is involved in these discussions so that right from the pyramid, it is then cascaded down to the counties so that one county is not, you know, giving out their own rules, but it should be from the point of county. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I just wanted to add something little for the international level. There is a increased demand for certain, you know, uh, requirements for the market, the international market. And this is pushed down to the farmer, you know, to meet certain standards and quality of the avocado. Mm -hmm. So this means, you know, hiring of labor, increased labor costs. I mean, it gets very expensive for the farmer. And of course, then they are not able to. It's, it's a trade body because when the costs are high, of course, it's good for employment because you find you hire more people to ensure a certain quality, but then at what cost? And uh, farmers may just give up and say, oh, I'll just uh, farm traditionally for, for the local markets and give up the international market where there are better prices. Yeah. Um, just a comment on the SES. I don't know if it has changed, but uh... If you do not pay the complete cess from the county of origin, then what you're paying along the way is basically a fine. So once you pay cess where you got the crop from, that receipt, you go with it across. You don't pay again. I think that's where I left it because even in Tanzania, if you don't pay in one mkoa, you'll pay all over the place and you might even get arrested at the border. So just check that. I'm not sure if it has changed, but just kindly check that. On a, on a trade barrier that we have in the international market, dispute resolution with the buyers, um, especially for the Middle East, is very weak. Um, Europe there is recourse if there's a dispute between the seller and the buyer. But the Middle East is basically Wild West. If there's any dispute, 
the law there basically just jails the person you're selling to. If they they can't pay you, they are put in jail. So even when you take it to the authorities for recourse, that person is thrown into jail until they pay you. So you you might just end up with someone owing you for several containers sitting in jail. It doesn't help you. Unlike Europe, where there's even insurance schemes against buyers. So that is a trade bar barrier. I don't know how it can be addressed because the Middle East is a big market. We are forced to even travel with our consignments. Once you verify the fruit is good, they pay you as you give them the container. Thank you. Any other barrier or strategy to improve? This, sorry? The trade cost okay. uh, compared, but I want my colleagues to probably uh, uh, input, uh, but I know the trade cost. Uh, from this part of the world compared to other destinations is a bit on the higher side. So that makes our produce uh, competitive when it gets to the destination market. Yeah, although this is a barrier, but I don't know how we can really... Yeah. <laughs> That will be challenging, I know. Maybe in terms of prices, but of course that will shoot the prices of our products high and becomes a challenge as well. How can we solve that? Well, I think, uh, I'm just guessing. I don't have an answer, but... Um, I think the reason why sea freight has been discussed and has been trialed is because right now the airlines decide on what to do and how to do, and it was proven, especially during COVID, and the prices are not going to come down. In fact, from an operational point of view, 60% is taken off from freight. So our hope as industry is that if we get the buying in of as many businesses to go the sea freight direction, we are hoping that the airlines will come running back and saying, hey guys, can we sit and have a discussion? Thank you. Um, uh, unfortunately, if you compare other ports and Mombasa for the sea freight, we, we are still paying maybe a thousand to $2,000 more than the other ports. Shipping from Peru to Europe and from Kenya to Europe, Kenya is still more expensive. So there is a serious concern on shipping as a cost. Uh, at the sea freight level. So really, I don't know whether, because um, this has also got to do with the uh, geopolitics. You never know, somebody uh, dominates a market and then determines. And, uh, you know, these people must be coming from uh, part of the world that they would prefer to give better rates so that the prices from that other part of the world, you know, can become uh, competitive. So, you know, but air freighting, I think, uh, I don't know, from um, Jomo Kenyatta, say, um, to Amsterdam is, I uh, think, depending on the airline, it's about uh, three US. Yeah, three US and a half per kilo, right? And the other destination is 1.8 to, you know. So really, uh, it is it is it, it is a barrier that uh, need also to be looked at very critically. But it is beyond our control. We cannot actually say that we're going we're going to have a solution to this.
any other i hope we have exhausted all the points that you had uh, written down if oh, yeah, there the is theory. anyone mm -hmm. now that you're saying it's on record and it needs to go on record i think uh, we were having a chat with you earlier about the the notes that you made and um, something came into mind that um now that we are talking about rail track from uh, you know most of the hubs within Kenya would be interesting to see how but then again it would be Mr. Muthiomi's docket to champion it to see how the rail can start collecting avocados rail them to Mombasa and then from Mombasa onto the vessel we had a discussion with government recently and Kenya Railways are going to put in plug-in points for reefers so that we can be able to maintain a very good cold chain. And so we are hoping that, well, the government is very good at promising. It had said by, and they are very good at even giving a number they had said by the 17th of December, those plug-in points would be in the wagons. Mr. Mutiomi is my witness. And that they would be good to go as far as the flowers are concerned. Perhaps, is it something that we could think about with the Avos? Over to you, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I think, uh, well, um, some of these things call for advocacy and a lot of it. And you will agree with me that uh, we've been um, trying to push the government to do some of these things. Um, for instance, there was the European deal that had just been frustrating us for the last few years because Europe had insisted on removing some of the products that we use to do some of our crops here on the on the MRL list. I mean, on the list of products that are, we can be allowed to use. I know, although the discussion was dropped by the European Parliament, it, is, it did not sit well with some countries. And you know, UK is not part of European Union now anymore. That's it and done. Well, um, our, our our mandate is, of course, advocacy. So we wish to continue putting the government into the toes, into the toes, so that it really delivers on what it, it is promising. It is a slow process, but I think uh, luckily there is a project now which is called BIP, funded by the European Union, trying to do some infrastructure. I think this is going to come out very clearly next year and some of the people in this room uh, I mean, everyone will be involved, uh, would be engaged through ASOC to see that uh, we are part of it because uh, the objective of that project is, of course, to ensure that there is more trade between Africa and Europe. And and sometimes they also need, need to keep their employees in those ports. Uh, if you go to the port of Rotterdam, I'm being I'm great jobs to a lot of people. So if there is no fruit or hot culture that is coming from Europe, from Africa to Europe, they also lose their jobs and they, they, they lose their businesses. And it's, of course, it affects the economy. So it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, but what I can say is um, Africa has an opportunity. Even when we talk about uh, the Kenyan avocado, we are, we are still doing 2% of, of on our markets. The per capita consumption on some of those markets for some of our products is below the, uh, I mean, below uh, some market standards. Avocado is 1.2 kilos in Europe. In the Americas is about 3.8. So you still feel there is a lot of ground for us to cover. But then, uh, of course, we need to put our house in order and try to do some marketing because this is about marketing. It's also creating positive vibe about whatever we are selling. 
So I think going forward into next year, we're going to see what we're going to do because these markets need to be grown and we need to tell our story. I mean, I, I believe we ship more than 5,000 containers every year or about that number. And not everything, of course, uh, is bad because our people keep buying, but there is a lot of improvement. And I am happy that uh, everyone is pointing at uh, where we really need to improve. Initially, people will just do their own things. Um, but there is a lot of positive vibe, I mean, including uh, from some of our government agencies that used to look the other side and, and receive kickbacks and receive uh, inducements to aid uh, some of these people. So I think I want to encourage everybody, Peter and um, Daktari and everybody else in this room, that uh, this is our industry. And uh, we must be very vigilant because uh, we have a lot of families that uh, depend on this value chain. And if we don't work, I mean, um, we have advantages that used to create jobs and do all these things. But because there was no one who has been vigilant about that, we've lost a lot. I mean, we've lost production to countries like Morocco, like on, on some of our value chains that really used to create jobs. So... Um, I don't want to put conclusion remarks, but I want to say I like and I'm admiring the discussions that are really going on. And uh, I want to do an undertaking that uh, ASOC is uh, is is uh, is well tasked. I mean, you're putting us where we belong. We need to make noise and we, we need to make this work. Thank you very much. Uh, see you. We appreciate those remarks and I think it will be a good point to end this discussion. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you for this particular session. I can assure you all the points we have been noted down. We, want, we are going to work together on this together with the STECO and the, and the EU to ensure that we have an easy access to the market. We may not solve everything, but we can try. So I want to take this opportunity to welcome Anderson to proceed from here. I have a question. My assumption is that uh, the cabinet secretary seated here are going to correct team A, team B, and C. Would it be possible to possibly share that on, uh, on soft? Yeah, we are actually going to uh, collect all the information and we are going to share the report with you and of course so okay through through the emails and also through the the avocado society of kenya so that you can have all this uh, in soft copy Thank you. thanks so anderson over to you Yes, so um, once more, I want to extend our gratitude, first of all, for accepting our invitation to be here today, and also for the very engaging discussion that we've had. That's really what we're looking, uh, looking at. And, uh, and we've had a lot of information, there were even some information that uh, we as experts were not aware of. So that's why we always say co-creation is, uh, is quite key because getting those very key details from the uh, stakeholders who are actually involved on the ground is quite critical so that we bring the expert knowledge and the uh, local knowledge together to come up with very concrete and practical uh, recommendations on the way forward. So basically moving forward, um, we still have two critical components of the project that we're engaging on after the report. So this is the first. The second one right now, we are also like doing some interviews with exporters, with importers in Europe on the same to get their perspectives as well, the challenges that they're facing. And they also like 
probably be criticizing you guys as well. So, <laughs> so we just want to get the information from, from both sides so that when you come up with this recommendation, it actually reflects the whole value chain, not just one, not just uh, the actors in, in Africa, but also those importers in Europe. It is really um, an important project. And as you must have heard from the representative from uh, the European Climate Foundation, where the ones funding this uh, project, they are quite interested in uh, seeing how we could work together with all the stakeholders to come up with better solutions that we will like win-win both for Europe and uh, for Africa. This, the second and last phase, the third and the last phase will be a regional workshop now with all the policymakers, both in the EAC and in Europe. So all the policymakers in Europe that are based in EAC with regards to trade, and anything regarding trade, we will have having that workshop in the Kigali sometime in January next year, where we we'll have to, where we're we'll feeding in all this information coming from the report, from this discussion, from the interviews with the with the importers, so that those who are making this policy should be, should be aware of the challenges that are really on the ground, because most often than not. When these policies are developed, it's mostly by consultants who just come out from somewhere, get some few interviews, come up with you know uh, recommendations based on their own personal experience or based on their knowledge. But now we want to make it to be a co-productive process whereby we involve all the different stakeholders in coming up with uh, solutions that we hope you know, could be adopted by the members of the e, uh, e, EAC and AU, EAC and EU, and how we could finally, uh, you know, take all the recommendations and put them into the policy documents that guide trade between Africa, especially EAC and and the and EU. I'm aware. I know you are all aware of the recent trade agreement between Kenya and the EU, the Kenya trade agreement. Yeah, it was supposed to be between East Africa, but for some reason, I think, um, I'm not quite sure if what I heard was that, you know, some of the countries in East Africa were not that really proactive to really push forward the argument. So that's why Kenya went ahead with the argument with EU so that the other partners can, can follow suit. So we're looking forward to actually shaping the policy between the European Union and East Africa in terms of trade. And that's why your input will be really, really relevant. Don't take this for granted as if we're just here just to talk and they write report. We are looking at it at a much more uh, higher level because that's the objective of the donor. Is they, is, they are called the European Climate Foundation. So it's been funded by the European Union. So, um, I want to once more to thank you again for your participation. I believe it has been a very productive uh, engagement. And uh, with that in mind, we, I believe we've come to the close of the, uh, the end of the workshop and want to wish you all a uh, very great evening and uh, safe trip back home. In terms of logistics, my colleague, Lut, Dr. Luther, will be handling that with uh, the other colleagues who are seated at the right-hand corner. And I believe, Luther, if there's any announcement we made in that regard, then you can do that uh, now. So once more, thank you for coming and wish you all the best. Thank you.